church online. Let's give God some praise this morning. Let's go. Hey. I was buried beneath, yeah, my shame, yeah. Now who can carry that kind of weight, yeah? It was my tomb, yeah. Till I met you, I was breathing, but not alive. Yeah, and all my failures, I try to hide. Church, man, we wish that we could be with you, but we're glad that you're able to spend some time home with your families, and we're glad that you're here online with us. Hey, we have a couple of announcements for you. First of all, if this is your first experience here at Project Church, you are a very important person to us, and we just want to share our gratitude with you. And so if you are new, make sure that you go to projectchurch.com slash VIP. We'd love to get to know you and get you connected to the body of our church. 
Also, we have baptisms coming up on November 6th. And so if you're ready to take this next step of faith, if you're ready to publicly declare your faith, make sure that you register on the Church Center app. We have a, an amazing team that's there to prepare you for this next step. And we are so excited for you to be baptized. Hey, and if you have a baby or a child that you're looking to dedicate to the Lord, we have baby dedications on November 13th. So we see that baptism is a personal declaration of your faith. And so with children, we dedicate them to the Lord. And so again, if you're looking to dedicate your baby or your child, make sure you go to the Church Center app and you can register there for November 13th. And if you're looking to serve here at Project Church, we have incredible teams that are waiting for you. And so again, if you're looking to serve, head to the Church Center app and you can check out all of the teams that we have to offer. And hey, when we're here in service, in person next week, make sure you go to the Blueprint course. At the Blueprint course, you'll hear all about our church, our vision, our mission, our blueprints, and you'll also get an opportunity to schedule a time to serve on any team of your choosing. And so make sure that you head out to the Blueprint course next time you're here at the church. Now we're gonna transition into a time of offering. And so in Proverbs 11, it says, one gives freely yet grows all the richer. And it says, another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. And I believe that the Lord has done immensely in our church when it comes to our giving, that he's been so faithful to us in our giving, that we have been enriched through our giving. And not because we serve a God that is transactional, but because we serve a gracious God that blesses us as we give. And so I just wanna encourage you, if you have made Project Church to your home, would you give today? We believe that the Lord is going to do so much through your offering today. And also it is, it is a worship to the Lord to give back to him what is already his. And so God, we just love you. And God, through this offering, we pray that you would do abundantly more than what we would ever think, God. That through this offering, Lord, that people would come to know you, that people would come into a loving relationship with you, that lives would be transformed, Father God. God, we know that you are a loving Father, that you are a good Father that doesn't just take from us, but uses our offering, Lord, to bless other people and to bring lives into a greater relationship with you. So Lord, we just love you. We give you all the praise and all of the glory through this offering. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen.
we ask you in this place to pour your spirit out wherever we're at, in our homes, in our cars, on our devices. We know that your presence is everywhere we go. You never leave us, you never forsake us. So God, pour your spirit out on your people right now. Remind us that you're at work. Even though we may not even be in the building right now, you are always at work work. So we say, thank you, Jesus. Pour out your spirit. May that come with revelation. May that come with a washing away of any guilt and shame. And may that come with just a fresh new perspective. Revelation of you above all. So we love you, Jesus. And we commit this time to you in your precious and holy name. Amen. Well, we are so glad that you tuned in today for just having church at home. Is anybody else having flashbacks of COVID? I am right now, but we're so excited to have you join us. A lot of exciting things happening at Project Church. And so today we are not continuing a series. We are not starting a new series, but we are just going to put an exclamation mark on what God is doing at Project Church. Um, we were in a series last month and it was all about favor. Favor is the word that has been over our church. And Pastor Caleb, my husband, he spoke a message and it was the favor of surrender. And I implore you to go back on YouTube, go back to any of the streaming platforms, um, podcasts, Spotify, and listen to that message because surrender has become a very impactful and profound word for our community. And then we came to the middle of October and we were teaching the women and the church that we find our true identity and value in being surrendered to our Lord, our Savior, our Christ, right? And so surrender has just been a word that has been vacillating in our spirits. And then came October 23rd. And we had to surrender to the Ironman races <laughs> that are happening here in Old Sack and downtown. You know, being here, there's just all kinds of unexpected things that take place, like road closures. So there's um, an opportunity for us to surrender. But it's interesting that when we surrender, the creativity opens. Wasn't worship great? I hope that you enjoyed it. I love that we get to preach in a different platform. I love that we get to share God's word. Creative is our spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So I hope you have the freedom of Christ in your home, experiencing his presence. It may not be in the four walls of the building at 1200 Second Street, but God is still moving. He's gonna move in the proverbial surrender surrendering to the Ironman race. But I really want you to just understand and take in this concept of surrender. If I had it my way, I would name this message this Sunday, Surrender Sunday. But instead, I want to talk to you about what happens after our surrender. When we surrender what we have held onto so tightly, we let go of former things. And when we let go of former things, God puts something new in our hands. He puts something new in our spirit. So I wanna speak to you today from Isaiah 43, 18 through 19, just two verses this morning, and just a couple questions and just a couple solutions. So Isaiah 43, 18 and 19, it says this, remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Did you know that God is in the business of doing new things? He does new things, especially in our surrender. When he sees us letting go of the old things, when he sees us saying, no longer am I going to be um, attached or married to my past that have, has caused my perspective and that has caused my habits to detain me from what God has fully had for, for me. When we finally surrender, he puts something new in our spirits. And I believe he's doing something new at Project Church. I feel like in a month that we've dubbed a month of surrender, we have given him space to give us something new, give us a new perspective. He is in the business of doing new things throughout the world, but I want you to know he's doing something new at Project Church. In the scriptures, you see him doing a new thing, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, 
If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That's in Corinthians. Isaiah is in the Old Testament. Now here we're in Corinthians in the middle of the scripture. And God is making all of us new creations because the old has passed away. Then Revelation 21, 5, at the very end of scripture, it says, And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. From beginning to the end, God was already creating with his spirit of freedom. He was creating something new in our midst. He will continue to do something new. It says, also he sat. Also he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. The concept of new is something that we can trust. If God is in the new thing, it's something that we can trust. I think oftentimes when we think about new, we're scared of it. There's a lot of unknown territory that that might bring us to. There are unknown emotions, unknown relationships. There's just an unknown that we begin to fear. But I want to encourage you today, if you feel a little bit in the wilderness, if you're feeling a little bit discouraged because you're entering into a new season, because you're entering into a new relationship, because you're entering into something new that you've never experienced, a new grief, a new layer of self-revelation, if you're entering into something new, God is trustworthy in it. He's trustworthy in it. New can be... Uh, translated in the Hebrew to two different words. I love how sometimes when you look up definitions, it says new. Um, It says the word that you're trying to define, but it's new and fresh. So you have to couple those words together because I think there's a mistake that we make in our own nature that says, well, I'm gonna get rid of the old. I'm gonna get rid of what God's not telling me to get rid of and I'm gonna walk into the new and I can trust that. We have to couple new with understanding of this word fresh because sometimes it's an old thing becoming something new. It's an old thing becoming something new and it's still good for you. Sometimes God uses things of our past to press us and to bring us sometimes pain. And the very thing that may have crushed us may be the very thing that can bring us healing. And I wanna dive into that a little bit longer, but let me give you a little bit more context about where we're at in scripture, where God is doing a new thing. You see, what happens is that the Israelites, they're delivered from uh, Egypt, and we see God part the seas for them, and they're in the wilderness for a little bit, but then we have to go um, a few hundred years later where we see that the Israelites, um, even though they're in a new place, they find themselves still worshiping idols. They're worshiping idols, they're disobeying God, there's evil um, humans all over the planet, even within the people of God. And so chapters one through 39, we understand that these Israelites, the people of God, they are in exile in Babylon and it's sort of a punishment for them. And this is a judgment reigning on God's people. And then there are prophets who are saying, this is where you are right now, but God is going to do something new. So in chapters one through 39 in Isaiah, We know that um, the Israelites are just plagued with this exile and they're not in Jerusalem anymore. They're not in their homeland and they're just spread and scattered. And you kind of lose your identity when you're um, being reprimanded by the Lord. But we have to understand God's hand in these first 39 chapters. But let me um, proceed. There were 70 years of this exile that took place. We get to chapter 40 on, we find and we come to the point in scripture where the Israelites are set free. They are set, he says, go back to Jerusalem. And, you know, essentially all these 70 years, that punishment is over. Um, there, that's been recompensed for your sin. And here we are in the chapter, in chapter 40, where they are welcome to go back into Jerusalem. But what we see happen the same way it happened when they were delivered from Egypt, is that the Israelites complain. Instead of bearing witness to what God allowed them to go through and save them from and be merciful merciful to them for, instead of declaring God's goodness and God's mercy over them and their disobedience, we see that they would rather complain and complain that God was ignoring them. 
How many times in your life when God doesn't show up the way you want him to show up, do we complain instead of saying, God, you have a plan in this. Instead of saying, God, there's things that I can work on that I need to recognize you're actually being merciful to me by allowing me to wait and keeping me from things that you know are not ready or prepared for me. You know, I I think complaining is the knee-jerk action when we are disillusioned. I think about what we just experienced um, at a women's event. We had a conference this last weekend. God did amazing things. And we were saying, yes, Lord, I surrender. We had these spiritual highs. We're lifting our hands. We're crying our faces off. It was just this incredible experience with God. But then we realized that our kids are in the same place. We realized that our husbands still have not changed. We realized that our work situation is exactly the same. We realized that our financial situation is exactly the same. And in just a matter of a couple of days, we're like, Lord, I surrendered everything to you. Why hasn't anything changed? I, I, I did this, now why don't I get this? So we're no different than the Israelites. We do the same thing that they do. We are still, however, the people of God. We may change in our temperament towards God. We may change in our perspective. We may change in our posture of surrender, but God never changes. He shows us and he reveals himself as steady, unconditional, sometimes merciful, sometimes forgiving, sometimes rewarding. He is a God that is consistent, but we aren't. (laughs) Today, I want to address that God, while you think that he is divinely neglecting you, he's divinely orchestrating something new. Orchestrating something new in your life. And so I want to show you what he does in chapters 43 on. He responds to the complaining of the Israelites, and I love this. This is like the best way you can possibly respond if you're a God. Essentially, especially in chapters 43 and 44, he actually boasts about himself. He boasts about how he's absolutely God. And you may have experienced 70 years in exile, but I was close to you. You may have experienced what you wished you didn't have to experience, but I was there in my perfect mercy for you. I want you to think about the situations that you are waiting on God for. He has not changed. The situation may not have changed. The outcome of your prayers may not be ideal to you, but we hold to the truth that God's ways are higher than our ways. There's no one like him. There's no one who would stick through things with us that we are grappling and that we are frustrated on. No other, no other person, I think, would be as patient as God is. He hasn't changed. And I love that the way God responds to us complaining is saying, hey, listen, I am God. I am absolutely God. My character is good for you. And I think that we need to get to the point where we respond to him saying, even though I'm waiting for a response, even though I'm waiting for the ideal outcome, you are still good. Let me just worship you. That is a surrendered heart. That is a heart that is seeking after his presence. That is a heart that is perceiving the new thing. Are you perceiving the new thing? What we are seeing is that Israel is hard-hearted. And when you are hard-hearted, you cannot perceive what God is doing. And this is why, I want you to take the focus off of yourself for a second. This is why I think it's so important for us as believers, for us who are representing Christ, to stop trying to, love people with tough love. I I want you to think about this. When people's hearts are hard, it cannot be remedied with tough love. I think in our own strength as humans, we want to love people in ways that we only know how. We don't have the fullness or we don't have the full revelation of who God is. And instead of loving them the way Jesus would love them, Instead, we, we almost want to scare them into alignment. I know I do this with my kids. I'm just kind of like, you better, you better get ready. You better fix your room. You better clean up. And I'm almost scaring my kids into alignment with what I want. But that's not God. We're, 
actually projecting shame on them. And sometimes we almost want to tell our kids, and my kids are the best example, or other people in your life, people that you know are acting a fool, and you're like, just get it together. Sometimes we want to like prove to them. Everything in us wants to prove to them that you, you have, it'll be better this way. And when we're proving them to get in alignment and to fall in line with what God wants for their life, we're actually projecting our ego on them because we're proving ourselves. The antidote for hard-heartedness so that people can perceive the new thing that God is doing is love. It is loving people patiently. It's loving even when they're complaining. It's loving even though they thought the outcome wasn't the best. It's loving them even though they're selfish. And it's the love of Christ that the rest of Isaiah is talking about is the key to all of humanity, is the key to Israel continuing to harden its heart and to continue to rebel and continue to have false idols. That We see in Isaiah, that is where the prophecy of Jesus is described. The promise of Jesus, after we see that the Israelites are in exile, and then we see that they are welcomed back into Jerusalem, but now they're complaining, we see that there's this hope of a savior because the law isn't gonna, isn't gonna work for them anymore. The law, the tough love is not gonna work, not even today. So I wanna implore you, we need a love like Jesus. But here's a question that I have for you. I have two questions for you. Number one, what's the barrier for you to perceive what God is doing in your life? What's the barrier? Why do you think that you may have found yourself in the wilderness? Why do you think that you're impatient right now? Why do you feel like you're praying some of the prayers that you're praying, just asking for God to hurry up and do what I want you to do? Well, like, why do you feel like there's a barrier to seeing that God is actually always doing a work. He's the way maker, way maker, the miracle worker, promise keeping God. But there's barriers to us perceiving what God is actually doing. And I wanna submit to you that we may be holding on to the former things. What the prophets are saying in Isaiah is to not think about the former things, to let go of the past, sometimes when we, you might be thinking, oh yeah, let go of the things that harmed us in the past. No, I think the perception we have of how God is gonna come through because he came through in the past that certain way, we expect him to move the same way today. I think that's a barrier to perceiving the new thing. It says in Hebrews 6, 1, therefore let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. You know what's that, that saying? There's, there's times when we first come to know the Lord and we're so excited that um, like everything that we run into is like God. Like God speaks to us from the barista that we got our coffee to. Then we meet with our pastor and like, oh, God was there. And then we open up our Bible and it was like, oh, that's God there. And, and it's like when we first come to faith with Jesus, it's just like all the, our brain synapses are going off and we're like, yes, God, you're speaking to me. And then we're in the faith for a little bit longer and it's like, where, God, where'd you go? And I wonder if one of our barriers is thinking that God's gonna move the way he did when we first met him. Can I tell you that God wants to do exceedingly abundantly more than he did for you when you were first saved? Yeah. He wants to do something new. He doesn't want you to stay the same. So he's saying, dig deeper, get lower, get more into my word, dig deeper, because I have something new for you. So let's not stay in immaturity and just expect him to move the way he used to move. He wants to do something new. He's a bigger God than what we can perceive. So when we pray and when we wait on him and when we ask him to give us a fresh, new springing forth from the wilderness, when we're asking him for something new, when we're asking him to help us perceive, we need to get to the point where we're, we're big boys and girls. <laughs> And we're not expecting him to do things that he's done in the past. We're expecting more. Jeremiah 23, 7. This illustrates this perfectly. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when they shall no longer say, as the Lord lives, who brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Jeremiah is saying, this prophet is saying, there's gonna come a day when we don't say, remember when he parted the Red Seas and that's the only thing that we get excited about. You know, I don't know about you, but 
when I think about the existence of our church in the last 10 years, it's easy to think of the good old days when we're in the Crest Theater or the good old days when we're at Assembly Music Hall and there was a bar in the back and it was just covering all the alcohol with, you know, um, banquet linens. I think about all these, oh, remember when we're at the bank? This was fun. We were at the bank and then when people gave their lives to the Lord, we had them go find their security in heaven in the bank vault. You know, like there were so many fun things that happened in the former days. But what if... We kept on expecting God to do things in three former places in Sacramento and did not believe that he could do something new in old Sacramento. God is wanting to do a new thing. He wants to move in new ways. I actually think that part of the reason why there's barriers to perceiving what's new is because our gaze is on the wrong thing. I wonder, and this is my next question, what must we behold in order to perceive the new? When you look at the scripture, Isaiah 43, 19, it says, behold, I'm doing a new thing. Even in 2 Corinthians, when it's talking about, you know, Christ making us new creations, it says the old has passed, behold, the new has come. Even in Revelation, it says, behold, I'm making a new thing. We must behold in order to perceive the new. What are you beholding? What are you looking at? What, do you, what has your gaze? Is it your trouble? Is it the things of this earth? Is it the things that you wish for? Is it the relationship that's not going well? Is it the relationship that's going really well? We are not supposed to behold those things. That is going to make our vision blurry for what God is doing new. And when we perceive what he's doing fresh in the spirit, our souls are refreshed. And you wonder why sometimes we end up purposeless and just kind of wandering in the wilderness. God wants you to perceive new. He wants you to perceive new. So what is it that you're beholding? It says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, and we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of God are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the spirit beholding the glory of God. We must behold God. We must behold him. If we are going to perceive the new, we must behold him. And beholding him is being in his presence, searching for him, looking for him, not looking at our circumstances, not looking at the things that are making us anxious, not looking at the things that are worrying us about our future, but to be in his presence, to dwell in the secret place and to behold him. Before you can behold, sometimes that means we have to search. Sometimes that means that we have to lay away all the distress distractions and cut out all the noise and and try to even try to behold him are we beholding him are we beholding his presence is our gaze fixed not on the things of this world not on the news reports not on the newspapers does anybody read newspapers anymore not on our times um times app not on our apple news app it's beholding the word of god the word of god changes us and if you think that it's a story of history It's just a story of good rules and good moral values. It is not, is the spirit of God speaking to us straight to our hearts because it is alive. And if it is alive, there's potential for new. Behold his word, behold his presence, behold his goodness. If you feel like you can't perceive anything new, just think about his goodness I was just listening to a song and it was not just stories. All these stories that we hear from days of old, the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. He's the God of today. He is I am that I am. He is the God I was, the God I will be, the God I am. And the I am, the present tense, is something new. So when we read 2 Corinthians 3.18... We see that when we behold the glory of God, when we behold who he is, all of his goodness, all the things that glorify his name, we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. We are being transformed into the likeness of God's son. 
When we behold God, we become formed into the image of his son. That's spiritual formation. That's discipleship. That's making the Lord our God, our Savior, and our Master. And when we follow him with everything that's in us, then we become more like him. The new thing is not new purpose, is not new jobs, is not new um, intentions. Like God wants to be glorified. That will never change. But when we allow God to do something new in us, when we start perceiving what he is doing, then it really ultimately is us becoming more like Christ. So how are you going to do that? How are you going to follow Jesus? How are you going to be a complete, true follower of Christ? And I just want to implore you, behold where his glory is. God is glorified through his people. He's glorified through his people. So are you spending time with the people of God? I want you to get in community. I want you to behold what God is doing in the people around you. Sometimes we want to complain about the people around us, but that's what the Israelites did. We don't want to complain. We want to see the glory of God in all of his people. When we behold his goodness, man, we love others more like Jesus does. I want you to behold him in your quiet time. I want you to behold him. You're not going to behold his glory if you never spend time with him. Are you spending time in his house? That's where his presence is. Are you spending time at prayer meetings, first Wednesdays, in community groups, with the people of God? There's so many ways that we can get plugged in in order to behold his glory. And when we behold what he is doing now, it's new. It's new and it'll change you. It'll transform you. You will become more like Christ. And can I just tell you, you can trust the new because you can trust Jesus. You can trust God. The new thing is something that you may be afraid of, something that you may not have seen possible. But God is the God of impossibilities. He can do greater than you can imagine. And I just want to attest to that scripture in Ephesians 3.20. To him be the glory who can do exceedingly and abundantly more than we can ask for. The new is more than you can even imagine. The new may be scary, but the new is trustworthy. The new is the presence of God that is alive and well and is changing and transforming you today. So let me pray for you. Lord, We thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for your faithfulness to the Israelites that we can learn from, that you are merciful, you are good, you are gracious, and you are absolutely God, the God on high. No one else is above you. So, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word, and thank you for the challenge, Lord to not allow our perception of what you've done in the past to be a barrier to what you can do today. God, thank you for the reminder that when we behold you, when we behold you, we behold the new. And God, we don't want our faith to grow stale. We don't want our faith to be lackluster. We want our faith to be alive and we want it to attract people to your kingdom. So Lord, I pray that this message would pierce the hearts of your people, that they would begin to start imagining new things that can take place in their life when they submit to you, when they behold you. And I pray, God, that any former thing that is trying to attach itself to your people, God, we break it off in Jesus' name. Right now, wherever they are at, we break it off in Jesus' name, trusting that you don't want those former things attached to them, keeping them down. We ask for just a a, a new revelation and a fresh anointing of your presence, God, that would heal them and that would give them opportunity for new. So Lord, we commit this time to you and we trust you to continue to show Project Church the new thing you're doing. We are perceiving it. We are trusting it and we're grateful for it in your precious name. Amen. Hey guys, we want to thank you so much for joining us for Church Online today. And if you wanted to make the decision today to follow Jesus, we want to give you the opportunity to pray along with us now. Go ahead and repeat this prayer for me if that is you. Say, Dear Jesus, thank you for forgiving me of all my sins. Today, I entrust you with my life, my past, my present, and my future. All my days are yours. I love you, Jesus. 
Amen. If that was you, we're so excited that you've made that decision. If you don't mind, in the comments below, say, I have decided. Hey, with that being said, we're going to be back for church at our building next week, and I wanted to personally invite you. We've got services here at 830, 1015, and 12. And don't forget, next weekend, we got holiday fun happening between every single service. And so if you're ready to come and have fun or you're ready to volunteer next Sunday, we could use you. But we're so excited to be joining again with you in our building. We'll see you next week, church.